Welcome to class 29 in topics in power electronics and distributed generation. Uh, today we will be discussing a uh, few problems. These are homework problems for the students in the class and example problems for the students watching on the net. Uh, so, the first couple of problems are related to distribution systems and relaying and then the other two problems are related to economic decisions that you could make in uh, making engineering choices for DG systems. So, in the first problem we are looking at uh, a on load tap changer which uh, at a distribution substation uh, 66 slash 11 kV and the, uh, the substation transformer has 9 taps and uh, each tap step is of 0 0.02 per unit. Uh, so, tap 1 corresponds to 0 0.92 per unit, tap 5 corresponds to uh, 1 per unit. So, if you are uh, looking at a single line diagram, you are having, uh, you are taking the on road tap changer as a uh, depending on where you are placing the tabs, you, so here if you are at tab 1, your secondary voltage would be 0 0.92 per unit. Uh, at tab 5, your secondary voltage would be equal to 1 per unit. At tab 9, where the primary turns is uh, say the small, uh, lowest, then your secondary voltage would be the highest. So, V s would be 1.08 per unit and uh, uh, so this is when you are having nominal voltages at the input and output and uh, you are having a 11 kV overhead line of 6 kilometers going out from the substation and you are given the feeder line has an impedance uh, resistance of 0.6 ohms per kilometer, x by r ratio is equal to 1. Uh, the loading of the feeder is uniform 25 amperes per kilometer. So, total 25 into 6, so 150 amps total uh, for this single 6 kilometer feeder and at a power factor of 0 0.9. So, you want to make plots of voltage profile, current profile etcetera. So, first we will look at the circuit implementation of the tap changer and uh, so how the on load tap changing is being achieved. So, if you want to change taps uh, in a structure such as this, if you uh, want to go from one say tap 1 to tap 2, uh, if you do it without interruption say if you simultaneously contact 1 and 2, then you are shorting a coil. So, you can end up with large currents in the shorted coil. So, how is that achieved and uh, what is the sequence of operations to actually limit the maximum current during tap change to be uh, uh, say 1 per unit the rated current uh, when you are doing the switching action. Uh, so, one possible configuration for, uh, uh, so if you look at the tap changer you can think of it as a, on a per phase basis. It is a one pole a nine throw switch. So, if you are on a three phase basis, it is a three pole 27 throw switch. So, uh, it is a it is essentially a switching action between multiple uh, throw points. Okay. So, how could the switching action be achieved while limiting the, uh, the short shorting current? So, you could include resistors. Uh, resistance of the tap changer to actually ensure that when you are actually having a shorted loop, uh, you limit the current. So, a sequence of uh, uh, actions for uh, the tap changing could be uh, say originally you might be uh, connected to tap 1. So, this switch might be closed and uh, under normal conditions your switch SA would also be closed. So, so, this switch would be in closed position. So, uh, your pole uh, is connected to throw number 1 through the switch SA and through switch 1. 
So, so this would be your starting configuration. You want to eventually go to a configuration where switch 2 is actually connected to the, uh, the throw corresponding to switch 2 is the one that is connected. So, the first step would be to uh, open, uh, open switch SA. So, once you open SA, the power flow would then be through uh, the resistance RTC. So, you want to have a small value of resistance so that you do not have large uh, drops in voltage and we will see that a small value of resistance is sufficient. Uh, so, once you have the, the, the uh, SA open, then at this point you could then close uh, uh, your throw 2 and with throw 2 closed and with SA open, now you have the resistance 2 RTC in the loop. So, if you want to limit this particular uh, uh, current to be less than 1 percent, we know that the voltage over here is 0 0.02 per unit. So, you want 0 0.02 per unit divided by twice RTC to be uh, roughly 1 uh, 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 your 1 per unit current, which means that your RTC is about 1 percent resistance. So, uh, it also meets the criteria that when you open the switch, you will not have a large drop across that particular resistor. So, so this would be your second uh, condition where uh, you have closed switch 2. Then under this condition, you could now open the throw 1, in which case the current flow will actually change from the top. It will actually now flow through this particular path and then you could uh, close switch SA back and because switch SA is closed, now your current diverts through the switch, which means that the losses in the resistor will be happening only during the transition time. Uh, you might be operating uh, a transformer maybe in uh, many tens of minutes, maybe an hour. Uh, it is not like something some that uh, switches very frequently. You are trying to ensure that uh, over the course of the day when the voltage levels uh, over a longer time frame uh, changes, uh, you want to ensure that your secondary sees the nominal voltage. So, in the next problem, you are asked to plot the voltage and current profile on the distribution feeder assuming the substation and voltage to be equal to 1 per unit. And uh, uh, this is uh, 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 based on the expressions that we derived in class and uh, we will also be uh, uh, discussing it in uh, part C of the problem. So, we know that with uniform loading, your current profile is going from uh, 0 to 1 per unit uh, 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 and in a, in a uniform manner uh, with a co constant slope because the loading is uniform and uh, the nature of the voltage uh, profile uh, starting from 1 per, 1 per unit uh, at the substation end, it drops to about uh, point slightly higher than 0 0.96 uh, uh, per, uh, per unit at uh, 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 at the at the end, uh, I, and uh, and th the expressions for this we'll actually look at in part C of the problem. So, so, the question is if we have a voltage profile that looks like this, uh, we do not want just the uh, loads connected at the feeder end to see close to 1 per unit voltage. We want to the average uh, user of this particular feeder to see voltage close to 1 per unit. So, it would be nice to actually ensure that the deviation at both ends of the feeder uh, stay roughly equal so that you are within as uh, the same tolerance range across the entire feeder. So, for that to happen, what should be the distance from the substation 
that the voltage should be that, uh, that is regulated to the nominal value so that the whole feeder voltage is kept minimal. So, for that we uh, the current distribution along the line is given by So, I at position x is I s to 1 minus x by d where x belongs to 0 comma d and the voltage at x is the voltage at the substation minus R L prime I s So, uh, we had derived this in class and I s is the feeder current at the substation and here R L prime is the total uh, feeder effective resistance. and it is given by R L which is the actual resistance into P with power factor plus the x by R ratio of the line into square root of 1 minus P square. So, so if we take the voltage at the end of the feeder uh, to be V D and V S to be the voltage at the substation end and we want this to be equal to 2 delta V then uh, this is given by R L prime I S by D square into D square minus D square by 2. So, our delta V is R L prime I S by 4. So, if we ensure in this particular uh, uh, So, if we ensure that this delta V range is uh, equal to that particular value, then uh, your average user of the uh, on the feeder will see voltage in the appropriate range. So, the distance at which uh, uh, you get this particular value for delta V is R L prime I S that is what we need to solve. So, we want to ensure that the voltage drop at x d of x x square by 2 is equal to this particular value which is R L prime I s by 4. So, this is a quadratic equation in x which can be solved to get the value of x. Uh, so, you have x square minus 2 d x minus d plus d square by 2 equal to 0 and a solution uh, in the range 0 to d is uh, d into 1 minus 1 by root 2. So, this is equal to 0 0.29 roughly at one third the distance from the substation. If you are regulating it to the nominal voltage then uh, over the entire feeder you will be within the same tolerance range. Again this is uh, assuming uh, that uh, you are having uniform loading, you are also assuming that uh, uh, your power factor is the same across the loads on the feeders, but this gives you a feel for what would be the nature of the uh, requirement to maintain the voltage along the feeder. So, in the next problem uh, we would like to see what could be an expression that could be used at the transformer to uh, uh, predict the re reference voltage that is required at the substation end. 
uh, based on this, uh, this loading uh, that we have just derived to ensure that the voltage regulation across the feeder uh, stays in the required range. So, we want V at x to be at x is equal to d of 1 minus by root 2 uh, need to be to 1 per unit and this is an open loop uh, because you are not explicitly taking measurements from that particular point and uh, using it to control the, the tap selection. So, you have V at x equal to V s minus uh, R L prime I s by D square into D square 1 minus 1 by root 2. So, this simplifies to V s minus 0.25 R L prime I s. So, you look at the total current at the substation end. Uh, so, this is essentially your actual feeder current and this term over here is essentially uh, a voltage boost. So, uh, so, if you look at the actual voltage that has to be uh, commanded at the substation V s star, it would be your nominal voltage. You want to keep this particular value V at x to be equal to the nominal. So, this is V norm plus 0 0.25 R L prime I s. So, this is essentially a boost term that you are providing uh, and uh, here we are assuming that the, the, the in an actual substation there are multiple feeders. So, we are also assuming that all the feeders have similar characteristics over the day. So, it is not just that one particular feeder has load, the other has no load. So, it is a similar type of consumption on, on uh, depending on the time of the day etcetera and you want to actually provide uh, uh, a boost action across all the feeders that go out from the substation. So, in the next uh, part of the problem, we, we are looking at the voltage at the high voltage and if it is 70 kV, what would be the tap position of the on load tap changer that would provide closest to 1 per unit voltage on the low voltage side. Uh, assuming there is no uh, compensation provided for uh, line loading. So, without the boost, uh, boost action what would be the voltage just uh, assuming the uh, primary side voltage has now gone high. So, what is the actual secondary voltage in this particular case? So, with uh, So, your V norm by your V at your high voltage actual would be 66 divided by 70. So, this corresponds to 0 0.943 per unit. So, uh, if your V actual was 66 kV, you would be at uh, 1 per unit. So, because your actual voltage is now uh, lower, so you uh, your ratio turns out to be 0 0.94. If you look at what would be the 
closest tap that uh, provides this particular voltage it would be the tap it would be the second tap. So, So, closest to 11 kV voltage it would be tap 2. So, if you look at uh, your actual secondary voltage, so you have 70 into uh, 11 by 66 into 0.94 which is the uh, tap that has been selected. So, you have 10.97 kV and then if you look at the corresponding uh, feeder voltage profile. So, you would have uh, so the one start the, the red one starting from 1 per unit is uh, the one corresponding to uh, uh, the base case where you have 1 per unit at the substation. at V s. So, at d equal to 0. So, you can see that in this particular case even though the secondary voltage has gone higher to 70 kV the actual voltage uh, at the substation end is actually starting at uh, uh, 0.997 and falls down uh, in a similar trend because the impedance profile is the same uh, along the feeder. So, it is not necessary that uh, you have a higher voltage on your uh, your primary you will see the same effect on the secondary depending on the tap selection you could have uh, uh, a voltage which could be on either side. Again this is because of the finite quantization effects you have only 9 taps you do not have a smooth variation of the taps starting from uh, say your minimum value to your maximum value. So, in the next uh, problem uh, you are uh, asked to actually uh, look at what is the tap position that the, the transformer the OLTTC would uh, provide closest to 1 per unit at a distance that is obtained uh, in part C where we are looking at, uh, at what position along the feeder you would like to regulate. So, here we are looking at the line loading compensation at a loading of 25 amps per uh, kilometer and when the high voltage side is sitting at 70 kV. So, in this particular case the So, so one thing when we consider say if we take 11 kV as your primary plus your parameters of your uh, uh, your substation current to be uh, say 150 amps your resistance of uh, RL prime based on the calculations we have just made. So, you know, one thing to note as this is on a, a phase basis. So, whereas your 11 kV is on a line to line. So, you need to make sure that you consider things on a line to line basis including uh, the appropriate change in voltage. So, this turns out to be 11.31 kV. So, if you look at your V s star 
by V norm you get 1.028. So, again uh, it is uh, uh, between 1.2 and 1.4 the closest being 1.2 it means that uh, you need to boost uh, of one tap because of the loading effect. So, your actual voltage, so previously you are sitting at uh, tap 2. So, if you boost it by one tap, you now go to tap 3. So, So, if you look at the feeder uh, voltage profile with uh, uh, with the line uh, line loading compensation, you will see that. Uh, so, the original case B was this one. Uh, in the next uh, case, we were looking at uh, the effect of uh, just the the voltage going to 70 kV. And here you can see that you are getting a boost effect uh, of uh, due to the line loading uh, compensation. Uh, ideally, you would like to boost uh, it to so that uh, uh, one third at one third distance you would get close to one per unit. But because uh, you your actual selection was uh, uh, 0.28, uh, if it was uh, boosted by one more step, the voltage at the substation end would have gone too high. So, this would give you the closest to the desired profile. So, in the next problem instead of uh, boosting it at uh, uh, say uh, 0.29, uh, 0.3 d. So, 0.3 d would correspond to uh, about 1.74 kilometers. So, instead of boosting the voltage at the 1.74 kilometers, if you want say you want to boost it at uh, uh, 2 kilometers distance, so that you want to have a slightly higher boost action, uh, then what would be the voltage? Uh, here for this particular problem, we are considering a slightly lower loading of 20 amps per kilometer and we are considering a voltage on the high voltage side at of 60, 62 kV. So, uh, uh, so, we are looking at uh, the, this particular uh, nature of the voltage profile. So, if you get V of x equal to V s minus R L prime I S by D square into uh, 2 D minus 2 square by 2. So, essentially you get V S star is equal to V norm plus R L prime I S by 3.6. So, essentially you get a slightly different boost term and if you look at the situation where in this particular case I s is uh, it would have been uh, 100 uh, say 0 0.15 uh, 
uh, kilo amps at 25 amps per kilometer loading at 20 amps per kilometer loading you have 0 0.15 into 20 by 25 equal to 1 point, point 0.12 So, this is the current So, if your high voltage uh, primary uh, uh, primary side voltage is 62 kV your desired tap point So, if you look at what uh, the is the closest to 1.065, so after 1.06 you have 1.08, so which is tap 9, so this would correspond to tap 8 would be the closest tap and your uh, V s star in this particular case would be 11 kV plus uh, uh, 4.8. 01 which is in which is your RL prime into 0 0.12 root 3 by 3.6 this would correspond to 0.12 so essentially again this would correspond to boost by uh, one tap so so your actual tap location would be tap 8 plus one tap boost for your line drop so your tap your actual tap location is 9 and your secondary side voltage uh, would be 62 into 11 by 66 into 1.08 uh, which would be 11.16 kV. So, if you look at where uh, it would lie, it would essentially lie starting at somewhere around here. So, this would be case G. So, starting at around 1.015. So, at distance 2 it is uh, again point around 0.98 per unit. So, again because of uh, the, the finite number of the finite number of taps uh, you have these quantization effects which means that uh, you cannot achieve exact number that you are targeting, but it would be the one that is close closest. So, in the next problem we are looking at uh, uh, the options for increasing the cap capacity of the line and uh, we are considering the case where uh, two conductors are uh, are placed in parallel on the uh, on the particular feeder okay uh, so in this particular situation what is the new voltage at the end of the line and uh, the case that is being considered is parallel conductors and uh, uh, not the case of parallel lines so, we will look at uh, what could be uh, 
uh, this uh, the possible si situations that you could have when you are say uh, paralleling conductors. So, if you look at the original line So, your so your original line might have say a pole with uh, say three conductors on top. So, this might be your original configuration. So, we are looking at say configuration 2 where you have a pole and you have now parallel conductors. Uh, on each insulator. Okay. You could also, so this would be the parallel conductor case. You could also have other configurations, say you could have a configuration uh, such as this where uh, you put two cross arms and then you have say uh, conductors on now uh, both cross arms. Uh, so, or you could have uh, uh, two poles. So, so you could look at what is the effect of uh, uh, these different configurations. So here, you could uh, you could think about uh, this as a parallel feeder line, uh, parallel circuit. So this say this is uh, case three, case four. Uh, if you look at uh, effect of uh, you will see that uh, your R line uh, is half because you now have twice the effective cross sectional area. So, it becomes R line by 2 and but and your x lines stays roughly the same. So, your uh, x value does not change because your loop areas are not significantly different for uh, the current conductors the distances between your conductors are roughly the same. Whereas, if you now look at the case where you are having uh, uh, say uh, parallel conductors, you now have effectively uh, uh, two parallel impedances, uh, es uh, essentially you will be changing your x line also. So, here your load loading capacity increases. your x by r ratio changes. So, your x by r whereas, uh, in option 3 and 4 your x line uh, would shift to up approximately x line by 2 which means that your x by r ratio would stay roughly the same. Okay. So, with this you could then calculate what is your effective uh, 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 say resistance of the new line. or your voltage regulation calculation your R L double prime is R L 2 by 2 because your resistance is halved, but your power factor is, uh, is P x 2 by R L 2.
So, if you look at your RL double prime, this is 3.19 ohms, whereas if your original line this was 4.81 uh, ohms. So, because you now have just parallel the conductors it does not half, but it uh, falls by a, by some percentage, but does not exactly half. Okay. So, if you look at your voltage at the end of the feeder assuming uh, 11 kV at the substation, your V of D So, this turns out to be 0 0.962 times your 11 kV. So, this is uh, 10.59 kV. So, if you look at the voltage profile, uh, you can see that the uh, original voltage went down to uh, uh, say 0.94 that was uh, around uh, 10.3437 kV. Uh, now, with the parallel conductors you have 10.59 kV. So, your voltage drop reduction is about 210 volts right, if this corresponds to 11 kV. Okay. So, uh, there is a reduction in voltage drop, but uh, it is not as much as uh, just taking the entire RL prime and uh, taking half of that. So, you could then ask what is the difference in power dissipation in the line? Uh, what is the power dissipation that happens in the line and what was it in the original configuration? and what is it when you have the parallel conductor as uh, in the case above. Okay. So, you can write an expression for the participation in the line. So, we know it, the expression for the current uh, which is I s into 1 minus x by d and R l is the total resistance of the line. So, your this is resistance per unit length is given by R L by D. So, we can write an expression for what is the power uh, dissipated along an incremental length delta x along that particular feeder is given by I of x square into R L by D into delta x. So, if you integrate this uh, along the line, your power loss in the line would be and you can write the expression for that I s So, you get I s square, uh, the d's cancel out R l 
by 3. So, this is the power loss per uh, phase of the feeder line. So, you multiply by 3 to get the uh, total uh, loss on a 3 phase basis. So, power loss in case B is 3 into 150. So, this turns out to be equal to uh, 81 kilowatts. So, 81 kilowatts happens to be around uh, 2.8 percent of uh, feeder power. So, so you can see that uh, th there is uh, quite a bit of uh, loss along the feeder and when you uh, have the parallel conductors. it is half of this particular number. So, you get 40.5 kilowatts or 1.4 percent of feeder power. And uh, often the reason for uh, putting parallel conductors is uh, may, uh, not from the power loss reduction perspective, it may be to increase the capacity of the line. So, the number that would be used when you have parallel conductors would be at not the same level of loading, there would be increased loading because you now your purpose for adding the parallel conductor is to actually serve more loads okay, often. And the limitations of how much power dissipation is often related to what is the temperature rise that uh, the conductors could see, uh, which would also limit uh, uh, how much loading can happen on a per kilometer basis. So, in the next problem you are asked uh, if you have uh, now 2 DGs that are installed on this feeder, uh, where would you locate it? And uh, there are if it is possible to uh, install 2 DGs on the line, at what distance and power level would the DGs lead to flattest voltage profile on the feeder and uh, look at the resulting voltage profile. So, if you look at uh, the case of adding uh, uh, the fewer uh, uh, the, the 2 DGs, uh, you can see that most of the voltage drop occurs because of the, the higher IR drops that are occurring on the feeder. So, an objective of adding uh, DG would be to actually reduce the, uh, the drop. The R is a property of the conductor, what you can alter is your current profile and by adding a DG at a distance of uh, 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 at 2.4 kilometers, which is uh, two fifth of the distance, and uh, at at uh, 4.8 kilometers, uh, you can actually uh, bring down the current level uh, amplitudes of the current to be uh, the smallest along the feeder. So, if you look at uh, uh, the the power flow in this particular case essentially your, your, your substation power is actually flowing in uh, to a, a short distance over here say section 1, section 2 and say section 3, uh, the power is flowing from say the DG. In section 4 and 5, it is flowing from say DG number, DG number 2. So, if you look at uh, then what would be the power rating for your 2 DGs, uh, your DG, each of this DG we would need to actually supply the power corresponding to this particular section of the feeder and the power level would be
there are 5 identical sections and the total length is 6. So, 6 by 5 and the location of the first DG is at the between your second and third section. So, you have 2.4 kilometers, the second is uh, 6 by 5 and the location is between your fourth and the fifth. So, that is why you get uh, 4.8 kilometers and your DG current rating would be 150 amps which would be the total overall but you are supplying it now to two sections uh, into 2 by 5. So, it is uh, 60 amperes at power factor of 0 0.9, 0 0.9 lead because uh, the loads are at 0.9 lag. So, if you look at your uh, MVA le level of your DG, this is 0 0.6 into 11 it is about 1.14 MVA and your power level is, is about 1 megawatt. So, you need about 2 uh, 1 megawatt DGs uh, located uh, appropriately to get the, the, uh, the flattest uh, possible voltage profile. If you look at uh, the voltage drop, now you can consider a short feeder of uh, the length of say the triangle in section 1 and you can calculate what is the uh, maximum voltage drop. The lowest point that it goes to is 0.99. Uh, 8 8 volts. So, there is uh, hardly any voltage drop you can see that in this particular case it was going to almost 0 0.94. So, it is uh, the voltage drop has become much flatter compared to the original uh, situation. The last part of the problem is uh, what is the power dissipation in this uh, uh, compared to the previous case. Uh, case B uh, then we could also consider the parallel conductors and the case when you have DG. So, you could uh, essentially uh, the procedure adopted could be you could calculate what is the power loss in one small triangular section and we know that there are 5 such sections to actually cal calculate the uh, power loss. So, if you look at it on a percentage basis, this is uh, about 0.1 percent. So, we can see that uh, compared to the 2.8 percent uh, in the original case, uh, the power dissipation has reduced uh, almost by uh, a very large factor and the power loss is reduced uh, significantly, but it is not always possible for us to cite DGs at uh, ideal locations and uh, you are and supply power at the desired generating levels. So, DC, uh, the DG can provide some level of service, but to increase the capacity of the line you need to put in parallel conductors. So, uh, having both options of strengthening your system and adding distributed generation can actually give you overall benefits. So, the second problem is on uh, switching uh, that we will discuss uh, is on the switching of uh, 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 switching of uh, DG and the grid. Uh, essentially, uh, you have a switch which uh, interconnects a DG and the grid and you want to see uh, what would be the transient currents. Uh, under two conditions, one say 
when you are operating the DG in parallel when the switch is closed and say you have for some reason there is a fault and the uh, voltage on the grid becomes a dead shot. So, you will have a transient current flowing out you want to actually look at what is that value. Then the second situation that you want to see is in response to the fault the switch has opened and now you have cold voltages of the grid and the uh, DG which are close by but not exactly identical. So, when you close the switch what would be the transient currents that are flowing between your uh, grid and the DG. So, for the first problem you are looking at uh, a model. So, your DG is 100 kilowatts, your grid voltage is 415. So, on a per phase basis it is 415 by root 3, uh, 50 hertz. The switch was closed and you are opening it. Your XL is 0.2 per unit. your power is 100 kilowatts, power base V base is 415 by root 3 to 39.6 volts, I base is 1.139 amps, Z base is 1.72 ohms. So, your X L of 0.2 per unit is 0 0.34 ohms. So, if your I fault is 239 volts by 0 0.34, so it is 696 amps RMS. So, if you are including uh, uh, taking the peak of the sinusoid you get a factor of square root of 2 including uh, including uh, transient effects. Uh, due to uh, large x by r ratios your peak fault current can be about twice square root of 2 times 696. So, you are talking about uh, about 2 kilo amps can actually flow out when you have a dead shot on the grid and your switch S takes a finite amount of time to open. So, uh, before it opens you might end up uh, with a fairly substantial peak current. So, the second problem is about uh, is about uh, what would be the uh, voltage what would be the maximum voltage error between your grid and the DG that can be allowed the volt, uh, voltage error amplitude. Uh, so, that you your surge current is kept below uh, 200 amps. Uh, here we will ignore the DC transient uh, switch uh, effect. Uh, so, if you but the 200 amps is the peak value that you want to uh, keep your uh, current below. So, So, you could calculate what your uh, your IRMS is 200 by root 2 is 70.7 amps. And if you look at the circuit uh, the error between your grid voltage and your DG voltage is the voltage that is being uh, applied across the inductor. So, you want to ensure that that voltage that is being applied it has a magnitude such that the resulting current RMS current stays below this uh, 70.7 amps. So, you have uh, your delta V by 0.34 which is your impedance is 70.7. So, your delta V RMS is uh, 24 volts. So, as long as your DG voltage lies anywhere in this particular circle uh, your 
uh, you would be okay because your amplitude error will not lead to a current greater than 70.7 amps. In the next problem you are asked what is the maximum phase angle difference between your grid and uh, DG voltage such that this condition is satisfied. So, you can see that the maximum voltage error could occur when uh, the voltage uh, is such that it is just touching the, the, the circumference of the circle. So, so, this particular tangent is just touching the circumference of the circle at this point, uh, this particular tangent is touching at this particular point. So, you could then uh, make use of that to calculate what would be the maximum angle error. So, you have delta theta is sin inverse so, sin inverse uh, delta V g delta V by uh, your E g. So, this turns out to be uh, 5.8 degrees or uh, 0.102 radians. So, it, it gives you an estimate of how far you can actually let your angle be so that your surge current is kept below your desired 200 amps. Then in the next part of the problem you are told that uh, instead of using 5.8 degrees your actual relay is set to uh, uh, close within a 2 degree angle. So, this particular angle is uh, held at 2 degrees and you are asked uh, what is the maximum frequency difference between your grid voltage and your DG voltage such that uh, you do not exceed 200 amps. So, so, essentially your grid voltage and your DG voltage they, they might be two vectors. Uh, so, they are moving apart at a frequency given by uh, 2 pi uh, f DG minus f G into your delay time of operating your switch because it takes a finite time for a switch to close. Uh, here you are told that your switch takes 100 milliseconds from your logic command to actual closing and you want to relate that to what is your maximum frequency error. So, you can then write an expression you can relate this particular angle uh, to be equal to 5.8 minus 2 <coughs> into pi by 180. So, you get essentially this which is your delta f. So, you get delta f to be equal to 0 0.106 hertz. So, if your grid voltage is uh, at 50 hertz you want to ensure that your DG voltage is 49.9 uh, hertz to 50.01 hertz, 50.1 uh, hertz in that particular range to ensure that the surge current during closing will not exceed 200 amps under the condition that you are closing now at an angle of 2 degrees rather than uh, 5 degrees. If you are closing at this particular point because of the delay you might have gone out to something much further out. So, you need to actually ensure that when you are closing a switch your amplitudes are matched, your phase is matched and your frequency is matched appropriately. In the next class we will uh, discuss a couple of problems related to uh, economics of operation of the DG which can help with uh, your engineering design. Thank you.